So, uh, for the proof of the ineffectiveness of social democracy is just history and the world around us. The, the complete failure of every regime that has attempted communism, from the Soviet Union to China to Vietnam to, to Yugoslavia to Albania, all they resulted was those kind of communist regimes in death and destruction on an on a unprecedented human scale. Hundred, well over 100 million people. And they did, on top of that, of course, the oppression, the, 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 the poverty, the filth, just the whole disgusting nature of life under those kind of regimes. And then if you look at socially democratic states, real social democracy. So Israel was really, a, to a large extent, a social democratic state. And probably the most successful one of all of them. And it was poor. It was poor. When it didn't have to be poor. And in order to become rich, which Israel is, relatively speaking, today, it had to free up, it had to reject much of its social democratic past. It had to move towards more and more freedom. Or if you take it to a country like Argentina, do you know that Argentina, a um, hundred years ago, a hundred years ago, was as, almost as wealthy as the United States, about the same. In 1913, the United States and Argentina had pretty much the same GDP per capita, or very close to the same GDP per capita. Since then, since 1913, Argentina has adopted a variety, a variety of different socialist policies, statist policies, social democratic policies. So the state didn't always own all the means of production, but it, it inv invoked socialism in that it you know, it owned the important means of production, it controlled the means of production, it regulated the means of production. Here's, by the way, a definition somebody had. I saw this. This is an econo economist-type definition of social democracy, not communism. It's social democracy. Here's, here are the four points of social democracy. Higher personal corporate tax rates and higher government spending. More worker protections, restricting the ability of companies to hire and fire, and less flexibility for companies to set wages based on worker productivity and to hire foreign labor. More reliance on regulations, more constraints on real estate development, more antitrust enforcement, and more state intervention in product markets, and a shift away from a shareholder-centric business model. More protections for workers and domestic industries through tariffs and non-tariff barriers, and more constraint on capital inflows and outflows. Now, by the way, based on that definition of social democracy, the United States is pretty close. Uh, under Bush, Obama, Trump, suddenly Trump, Obama, it's pretty close to this, right? Ob uh, Trump added the tariffs and non-tariff barriers, but really, I mean, this is all the, the shareholder-centric, moving away from shareholder-centric, that's a big push over the last 30 years. Higher personal uh, uh, corporate taxes. Well, corporate taxes have gone down in the U.S. That's a good thing. So we moved away from social democracy with, with Trump on that one. Higher government spending. Moved towards it with Trump on that one. So we're kind of a, this mixed bag of a bunch of these, but not all of them, right? A bunch of them, but not all of them. Suddenly, all of these, you know, sound like Bernie Sanders. They sound like Elizabeth Warren. They sound like AOC. I mean... That's social democracy. That's where they want us to head. Now, countries that have that, countries that have higher personal corporate, ta personal corporate taxes, higher government spending, more worker protections, uh, restrictions on hiring and firing, less flexibility to set wages, all of this stuff that I just read you. Where do you think countries like that, how do they perform? Well, Argentina is a great example of that. It was as rich as the United States. Today, it's much, much, much poorer than the United States. There's a graph. So by the way, if you're interested in kind of these econ economics of freedom kind of issues, I highly recommend Daniel Mitchell uh, and his, um, his uh, 
blog. So it's called danieljmitchell.wordpress.com. danieljmitchell.wordpress.com. Highly recommend you subscribe. I get his stuff off of LinkedIn. You can friend him on LinkedIn or you can just go to his podcast, his blog. His blog. He has excellent stuff. He always has great graphs. He always illustrates, concretizes well. You know, again, he's not philosophical. He's, he's certainly no objectivist and he's not, he doesn't deal with the moral issues. But on the practical side, he's one of the best out there in just describing what's going on, what's wrong with the stuff. And he's almost always, I mean, I, I agree with him on 90 plus percent of the time, which is very rare. Um, anyway, he has this graph showing over the last 100 years, since 1913, 105 years, uh, how... You know, by how much has a, an economy grown on a per capita GDP basis? That is on individual wealth. American wealth, for example, has grown, and I think this underestimated dramatically, by what the graph looks like, I'd say about eight, eight times. Eight times, not 8%, eight times over the last 105 years. Taiwan, which 100 years ago was an unbelievably poor country, has grown 41x, 41 times. South Korea, which was at the end of the Korean War, and it, well into the, actually, 1950s, post-Korean War even, was poorer than North Korea, has grown in excess of 30 times. Most of that just in the last 50 years, not even 100 years. Argentina, between two to three X, less than half of the United States. Today, Argentinian uh, GDP per capita is less, well less than half of Americans. It used to be half. And why? Because they adopted, because they adopted all these policies. Social democracy. Oh, but you might say, wait a minute, but Norway and Sweden and Denmark, they are, they are social and democratic countries, and they're rich. They're rich. And yeah, no way has a higher GDP per capita than the United States, almost exclusively because of the oil. Sweden is a little below the United States average. Denmark is below the United States average. Um, Finland is below the United States average, although Finland is quite a bit below. Finland is the poorest of those, of those countries on a GDP per capita basis. Um, but those countries are not socially democratic. Let's go through this. Higher personal and corporate tax rates. They have higher personal tax rates, but low corporate tax rates. All those countries have relatively low corporate tax rates. Higher government spending. Not much. Not much higher than the United States. More worker protections restricting ability of companies to hire and fire. Less than the U.S. It's easier to fire somebody in Denmark than it is to fire them in California. Less flexibility for companies to set wages based on worker productivity and or to hire foreign labor. Much more freedom to do that in Scandinavia than there is in California or in much of the United States. Labor laws in the U.S. are worse, more restrictive than in Scandinavia. More reliance on regulations, much less reliance in Scandinavia. More constraints on real estate development, not sure. I mean, but I think there's less zoning and constraints, certainly in the parts of the U.S., the big cities in the U.S. where real estate prices have gone through the roof, are the most, some of the most constraints in the world. More antitrust enforcement, no. And more state intervention in product markets, no. None of that exists in Scandinavia or as at the levels of the U.S. and Scandinavia. A shift away from shareholder-centric business models, no. Not since the 19, I'd say not in the last 20 years, and not before the 1960s, these countries have been low regulation, low worker protections, shareholder wealth maximization models for public companies. And then the final one, more protection for workers in domestic industries through tariff and non-tariff barriers. Scandinavia is more free trade than the U.S. Certainly under Trump. More free trade than the U.S. So no, none of these companies exhibit the characteristics of democratic socialism. I mean, it's funny because when, when, uh, when uh, Bernie Sanders said that Denmark was a socialist country, 
the prime minister of Denmark came on television in Denmark and said, we are not a socialist country. I want everybody to know that we are not socialist. And the funny thing is that I just read an article about the new right-wing government in Norway. Norway's had a right of center government since 2013 for the last six years. Sweden is not socialist. They don't have a socialist government. They have, a, I think, a coalition between the right and the left, both right of center. Now, they're all too statist in my mind. They all redistribute wealth too much. They all have too high, high, taxes that are way too high. But on these other issues, they're freer than the U.S. Freer than the U.S. <sighs> all right. So countries that adopt socialism are basket cases. And the more socialism they adopt, the more consistent they are about adopting them, the more disastrous they are. You can look at this graph that uh, Daniel, Dan Mitchell provides in terms of wealth per capita, GDP per capita, and you look across the chart and you see the countries that are least socialist are the richest, and the countries that are most socialist are the most statist, are the most state-controlled, are the poorest, no matter what the history is. Even if they used to be poor, if they've adopted capitalism, they become rich, like South Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, even Japan, if you consider how poor they were once during World War II. And countries that used to be rich, like Argentina, uh, Romania on a relative basis, so uh, some of the uh, 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 countries that were rich before the Soviet Union took them over and where they are today, are poor today, poor today. So we've run this experiment over and over and over again. Once in a while, the, you know, when I debate these people, debate these socialists, they'll mention a co-op, I think in Spain, that works very well. One, one, co-op. One, significant company run by employees in the world who runs okay. And I'd have to do research to figure out, are they subsidized? Who helps them? Or do they really run okay? One, as compared to the wealth, the unbelievable amount of wealth that has been produced uh, globally by private companies and by relative free markets. When you say that society has no responsibility here, you, I think individuals have a responsibility to themselves. Is that it? I don't like the word responsibility involved here. All right. Well, what should we say then? Help me. What do I... Do what I wish to do. Is that your point? That the more... No. Do what I rationally think is right, according to the right morality. Uh, and help others if you can, but not as a primary obligation. And now, in regard to society, there is no such thing as society, you know. It's all of us. Now, how can we have obligations which we didn't undertake? See, the parents of a child would have obligations for him up to a certain age since they brought, brought him into the world but they can't do what is impossible to them. So it doesn't mean that, that they can at any moment s throw the burden on the rest of us. We're society, everybody's society and we can't have unearned obligations and unchosen obligations. What in the Ayn Rand civil context would be appropriate societal measures to accommodate the ungifted. Their own parents, and a chance to give their parents to earn money. If, however, their parents are poor and cannot assume it, it's a big, heavy burden, then you can appeal to private charity, as it was always done before welfare statism in this country. You want private charity as well for the gifted? Uh, if necessary. They usually, in a free society, they won't need it. They'll make their own way, just so you don't stop them. But uh, p 
private charity cannot be done by means of tax collection, which means by fraud. Private charity is up to you, and if it's a worthy cause, that is, let's say, a subnormal child who certainly cannot help it. It's perfectly all right to help him, but not at the sacrifice of your own child. Uh, you probably like to get rid of HEW then. Oh, certainly. Oh, well, certainly. Uh, more, much more than that. Uh, uh, I'd like to get rid of. Uh, a lot of the government, huh? Everything except the basic duties of the right. government, which is police, law courts, armed forces. Uh, you want less government. Uh, all right. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, everybody says that. It's a little hard to put that into effect when we've got a company, a country that has such uh, a, a maldistribution of wealth. Uh, you give me that, huh? Too few rich, too many poor. Uh, I, w I will give you part of that. Because if there is a maldistribution, it's to those who have political pull. If some of your money is made with government help and government fav favoritism, then I grant you that is unfair and improper and unjust. But if you made it yourself, in free competition, enough people want to pay you for your mm -hmm. services or your product, then you should keep all of it. Why shouldn't you? You made it. All right. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, that's really uh, you, you also think if, if the Middle Eastern countries want to charge, hold us up for the oil at $5 a barrel, or a, a gallon, excuse me, $5, will that day ever be back? They ought to be able to do it. It's their oil. Is that your point? No. My point is, we should not have permitted altruistically to all those nations to nationalize what we built for them. They took... <laughs> we are now moving towards complete collectivism or socialism, uh, a system under which everybody is enslaved to everybody. And we are moving that way only because of our altruist morality. Ah, yes, but you say everybody is enslaved to everybody. Yet this came about democratically. I and the free people in a free country voted for this kind of government, wanted this kind of legislation. Do you object to the democratic process? I object to the idea that people have the right to vote on everything. The uh, traditional American system was a system based on the idea that majority will prevailed only in public or political affairs, and that it was limited by inalienable individual rights. Uh -huh. Therefore, I do not believe that a majority can vote a man's life or property or freedom away from him. And therefore, I do not believe that if a majority votes on any issue, that this makes the issue right. It doesn't. All right. Then how do we arrive at action? How should we arrive at action? By voluntary consent, voluntary cooperation of free men, unforced and officials. The powers of government are strictly limited. They will have no right to initiate force or compulsion against any citizen except a criminal. Uh, those who have initiated force will be punished by force, and that is the only proper function of government. What we would not permit is the government to initiate force against people who have hurt no one, who have not forced anyone. We would not give the government or the majority or any minority the right to take the life or the property of others. That was the original American system. When you say take the property of others, I imagine that you're talking now about taxes. Yes, I am. And you believe that there should be no right by the government to tax. You believe that there should be no such thing as welfare legislation unemployment compensation, regulation during times of stress, certain kinds of rent controls and things like that. That's right. I'm opposed to all forms of control. I am for an absolute, laissez-faire, free, unregulated economy. Let me put it briefly. I'm for the separation of state and economics, just as we had separation of state and church, which led to peaceful coexistence among different religions, after a period of religious wars, so the same applies to economics. If you separate the government from economics, if you do not regulate production and trade, you will have peaceful cooperation and harmony and justice among men.